Good evening, guys, and welcome to another episode of The Angry Astronaut, keeping super busy with all of the really pressing issues uh, that are happening right now in the world of spaceflight. And this one I've been wanting to talk about for a while because... As some of you may have heard, although it hasn't really been talked about a great deal, uh, the European Space Agency, or rather the architect and engineers who designed the IHAB module for the Lunar Gateway, which is the largest and most important habitation module for this space station that will be orbiting the moon during the Artemis missions, well, all the details on that finally came out and... It sucks. That's right. It sucks. So why does it suck? Well, only one reason. Size. Now, size comes at a premium in space, no matter what you're talking about, especially if you're talking about space stations, especially conventional space stations. But this station, this particular module, is horrible. Seriously, it is so bad, it is so compact, so constricted that the astronauts are going to have a hard time even doing their work. Prisoners back on Earth who are in 23-hour lockdown for multiple murders, they've got a better setup than astronauts going to the moon are going to have, especially the astronauts who are unfortunate enough to get stuck on the lunar gateway while the other astronauts who are picked to actually make a journey to the moon get the chance to do their thing. Seriously, any prisoner in 23-hour lockdown is going to have a much better situation than Artemis astronauts are. I'm going to tell you all the reasons why this is the case and what can be done to improve all of this in just a moment. So just how small is this station? <laughs> Let's find out. So just to be clear, the IHAB module is being designed by the European Space Agency, and it was always going to be small. Anything that you have to send all the way out to lunar orbit is going to be small and relatively light. However, ESA never imagined that it was going to be this small. This early conceptual design that we're looking at right now is actually significantly larger than the final design came out to be. Earlier this month, during the Czech Space Week conference, a space architect and design researcher at the Austria-based Liquifer Space Systems, who by the way has been assigned to design the IHAB module, said that the Lunar Gateway would be roughly one one-sixth the size of the International Space Station. The entire space station would be that big. And by the way, a lot of that size is reserved for instrumentation, power and propulsion, and other systems. The architect's name, by the way, is Rene Wasilovic, and I'm sure that I'm mispronouncing that, but this is what he had to say. Quote, I have will have habitable space of about eight cubic meters, and you'll have to share it with three others. In other words, that would be a room two by two by two meters, and you are locked in there. You are living in a machine room. The life support systems make noise, they have a lot of fans, and you have a tiny amount of private space where you can close the door and tame the noise. The IHAB really is just a cylinder with a hatch on each end and two hatches at the sides and a corridor going through the length axis. Even if you want to pass one another, it's already quite difficult. You have to interrupt whatever you are doing in the moment to let the other person person pass by you. Well, at least while orbiting the moon, you're going to get a magnificent view of a sight that very few human beings get to see in person, right? 
Well, not quite, because iHab doesn't have a window either. Those things come at a premium, they're very heavy, and they disrupt the entire engineering design, so that went as well. So yeah, as I said before, any prisoner in 23-hour lockdown would have a better situation. Prisoners in 23-hour lockdown at least get an hour a day to go out on the yard to have a little bit of space, a little bit of exercise. Artemis astronauts aren't going to get that benefit. Also, prisoners in 23-hour lockdown at least get a tiny little window, usually anyway, that lets in a little bit of natural light onto their surroundings. Artemis astronauts aren't going to get that. And then, of course, the last really entertaining detail of what Artemis astronauts are going to be subjected to that prisoners in 23-hour lockdown don't get subjected to because this station is outside of the protective shield of Earth's magnetic field. Well, that means that they're going to be subjected to a lovely cocktail of solar radiation and cosmic rays. <laughs> So why the hell does this thing have to be so small at this point? Well, I found the answer in a paper entitled Interior Configuration Concepts for the Gateway I Have that was put out by the engineering and architectural team designing this thing. Quote, the main factor driving the I Have interior architecture is the overall interior dimensions, volume, and mass that have been determined by the launch vehicle capabilities. Initially, I have was to be launched by SLS, allowing for a launch mass of 8,000 kilograms, a module internal length of 6.6 .6 meters, and an inner diameter of 4.2 meters, the latter being determined by the SLS payload shroud dimensions. Subsequently, the SpaceX Falcon Heavy has been proposed as an alternative launch vehicle. This has further constrained the IHAB to an inner diameter of 3.4 meters due to reduced reduced payload shroud dimensions, and the need to accommodate the docking targets for the radial docking ports. Also, the use of the Falcon Heavy requires that IHAB be launched in tandem with the service vehicle for maneuvering to lunar orbit. To accommodate both elements on Falcon Heavy requires the IHAB module length to be reduced to 5.9 meters. A further constraint is the requirement for IHAB to accommodate both axial airlines locks to other gateway pressurized elements, as well as two radial airlocks for cargo vehicles and lunar landing vehicles. Both axial and radial airlocks require overhead space for the open hatch doors. Other design drivers to be considered are separation as far as possible of crew hygiene facilities from proof food preparation and consumption, assuring a permanent 810 millimeter by 1140 millimeter emergency egress translation path for the crew and separation of crew work area and living quarters. That's a lot of constraints for such a tiny module. But of course, a lot of you are probably saying, what's the big deal? I mean, Starship is going to have a huge habitable volume, and that's what we're going to be using to land on the moon, right? Well, you'll notice from this gateway build-up animation that Starship is not included anywhere in this process. And by the way, this was released by NASA only five months ago. Currently, NASA does not seem to be fully convinced that Starship is going to be ready in time to actually deploy astronauts to the lunar surface, and they may have to look for alternatives. And it's also worth mentioning that even if Lunar Starship is is the primary vehicle that is used to land on the moon both in the near and distant future, Starship is not designed for long-term orbital activities. That is to say that its life support systems are designed to get the astronauts down to the moon and get them back to the lunar gateway, not to serve as a long-term component of the space station itself. Granted, Lunar Starship could be modified to serve these purposes, but there doesn't seem to be a plan to do that at the moment. 
and there isn't going to be any relief for the astronauts anytime in the foreseeable future. The various logistics and airlock modules being added in the future are not going to add any significant habitable volume. So what are the astronauts going to get? Well, let's have a look at the paper again. Quote, the crew galley facilities include a foldable table that provides space for four crew jointly during meals. When not required, the table can be fully retracted. Okay, that's kind of nice, I guess. Crew sleeping quarters have been placed on either side of the radial airlocks. First design analysis of crew sleep stations and related activities demonstrated that all requirements regarding crew quarters can be fulfilled. In other words, coffin-sized crew quarters, but I guess that's all right, too. A deployable sleeping facility is therefore proposed that can be retracted from its deployed volume of 1.47 cubic meters to 0.67 cubic meters when not needed, thus providing free space around the radial airlocks. The toilet facility is housed in an overhead container. That sounds kind of scary, but remember, microgravity between the radial hatches. This position is as far away as possible from the food preparation and eating facilities given the constrained volume in IHAB. To be quite honest, I don't see how they could put those toilet facilities far enough away from the eating facilities given how constrained the space is in this module, but let's move on. The crew exercise device is housed in the center aisle subfloor between the radial airlocks. The position in the subfloor allows that the exercise facility can always be used, though it can be dismantled and stowed if required. The crew work area is dedicated to science equipment boxes, work console, glove box, and refrigerator. Lots of stuff crammed into a very small space. Placement of storage containers so they are easily accessible to the crew is an important design driver. The design presented here foresees 5 to 6 cubic meters of stowage volume, up to 32 single cargo transfer bags in four section and 29 cargo transfer bags in the aft section. And just to put things into perspective, the Salyut 6 space station from the Soviet Union designed, by the way, for two cosmonauts most of the time, was actually about a half a meter wider than this module is. When it comes right down to it for sustained missions orbiting the moon, this damn thing is just not large enough, given all the systems that it has to contain as well. Two cubic meters per person is just not sufficient, and also, it's downright dangerous. Radio Radiation protection, at least the best kinds of radiation protection available to astronauts in interplanetary space, will be at least half a meter of water completely surrounding the astronauts inside any given module, at least in the radiation shelter areas and preferably throughout the entire space station. That is simply impossible in a module this size. So what's the solution? Well, one obvious solution would be to make sure that Starship's habitable volume is going to be included in the Lunar Gateway design. But there's another solution as well, and that, of course, is the Sierra Space Life Module. This module can be deployed on any rocket that has a fairing of at least 5 meters, which includes not only SLS and Starship, but also Vulcan Centaur. Now, is it it 8 metric tons? Well, probably not. But given that the basic life module that's designed to be carried to orbit easily, by the way, by a Vulcan Centaur is 300 cubic meters in size once it's fully inflated, let's say we size that down by half to 150 cubic meters, that's still triple the size of the IHAB module, and I have little doubt that a life module of that size would fall within the mass constraints of the current mission parameters. Sierra Space did propose this solution to NASA years ago when the Lunar Gateway was being designed, and they rejected it simply because they still don't trust inflatable volumes. But at this point, I don't see where NASA really has a choice. If they go with something this tiny and this impossible to properly shield against radiation, 
I think that this is a death trap for any astronauts who are assigned to long-term missions orbiting the moon, and it puts the entire program at risk. Now, Artemis astronauts, of course, are going to be expected to endure very difficult conditions and to take enormous risks on their return to the lunar surface for the first time in over half a century, but we need not expose them to needless danger and unwarranted gambles, and that is exactly what this tiny little death trap represents, in my opinion. There are far better solutions available to us. Technology has advanced substantially since the time of Apollo. Indeed, it's advanced substantially since the time of the International Space Station. We need to take that leap forward if we really intend to colonize the solar system and return to the moon to stay. Please subscribe to my channel. We are 6,000 subscribers away from that magic 100K. Please check the description for various ways to support this content. Please like this video, and as always, stay angry about space.